you guys hear me all right? Cool. <laughs> this is how Major Merritt likes to be introduced. They yeah. see each other's truck because even though he's a good looking ball man, he's only the second best looking ball man of the year. Yeah, I do look like a doppelganger. Uh, we hear that a lot. In fact, we joked about training off in case I would just dress up as Major Marin and then I would give his talk and see what would happen. Um, but no, seriously, on a, on a more serious note, it's, it's really my honor to introduce you guys to Major Colin Marin. Uh, he's a 2006 grad of the Air Force Academy, and after leaving here uh, with a degree in math, he went and um, guarded the nation in, as a missileer and then went on to the space operations. And many of you know him uh, as he teaches math here. He also works in the registrar's office. We've got him for a few more months before he heads over to Schreiber Air Force Base. Well, I gotta tell you about that later. Yeah, taking care of all of us. But outside of, um, outside of those basics, there's a lot more to, to Major Marin. Major Marin is uh, he's a world-class athlete. And I know you would probably tell me, shh, don't say things like that. But not only is he a phenomenal rock climber, He's climbed some of the, the tallest peaks in the world, peaks that people dream of. Uh, I spent uh, over 45 days with him, above 17,000 feet. I trusted him with my life. He's trusted me uh, with his life. We cried at up our airplanes fly together in manly ways. Um, <laughs> Mitch Marin is more than just a mountaineer and an airman. He's a leader that leads with his heart. And part of the story you're gonna hear today is how he changed some of the paradigm on Mount Everest. That he helped do something that has that really hasn't been done in the past. And it's something that, that I, being on Mount Everest with him and leading the, our American team up there, I'm so proud of him because I think I'm good with people, but I'm not nearly as good with, with human beings as, as Major Merritt is. Uh, he does lead with his heart. He's, uh, he's an adventurer of both physical nature and spiritual nature. And in fact, he's about to go on his biggest adventure when he gets married this summer to his fiance Lisa, who is here with us. And I gotta say, I'm pretty psyched. They invited Padre Rob Marshall to be the officiant. So I'll be He's a stand-in, too. Um, without taking out any more of his, um, his awesome story, I'm going to hand you guys off to an amazing American and a great airman and a good friend of mine, Major Colin Marin. Thanks, Rob. I got it right there. Okay. Thanks, Rob. I got my little poem mic on, too. Um, so, Mount Everest. What are we here to talk about today? Mount Everest. Everybody knows what Mount Everest is. It's the Everest of Everest. Yeah, it's the Mount Everest of mountains, right? Um, <laughs> I had a couple corny jokes queued up. That's not the, first, that's not the last one. Um, <laughs> But yeah, Mount Everest. I mean, people have written books about it. People have written articles about it. They just put out a movie a couple years ago about it, which is uh, pretty intense. Um, we all have an opinion about it. We have all know what it is. If you go to a climbing gym and you start to talk to the climbers hanging out in the gym, they all have opinions about it, you know, how it should or should not be climbed. Um, and even if you're not a climber, you know what it is, right? And especially here in the Western world and in America, we're a people that are captivated by biggest, fastest, strongest. We love superlatives. This is this thing that gets us into the Olympics. It's this thing that like, we just love competition, right? And especially here at the Air Force Academy where we're type A competitive people, we love this stuff. We love hearing about it. And me standing here talking about it is a testament to how it captivates our imagination. And particularly for us in the military, the idea of being the best at something isn't just this neat concept, right? It's an it's a existential necessity for us. When we go off into these battlefields, we can't just be like, oh, it'd be nice to be the best at this. No, we have to be the best at it. So again, this, this notion of superlatives is something we're interested in, right? And then on the other hand, because everybody in the world has the same highest mountain in the world, it attracts people from all over the world to base camp. You have different nationalities, different languages, different religions, different cultures, different principles and values, all converging in base camp for this singular purpose, this fixed idea of getting to the top of the world. And this melting pot of people and ideas and values creates some really interesting characteristics and personalities in base camp. 
So here I am getting ready for the climb. Uh, if there's a sign that says Everest on it, you know I'm going to get to the top of it. <laughs> um, but what the heck was I doing there? Well, in the end of, or late 2012, beginning of 2013, I was invited to uh, climb with these studly gentlemen, uh, affectionately referred to as the boys in blue because of our sexy blue jackets. Um, but this team of people were assembled by my buddy here, Rob Marshall, to bring the United States flag to the summit of all the high points on the seven continents, known as the seven summits. And Mount Everest was the last of these seven summits to bring the, the flag to. And I was flattered to be invited to join this team. These are some of the strongest mountaineers I've ever climbed with. But above and beyond that, we quickly uh, received a reputation throughout the Everest mountain as being one of the strongest teams that had ever been on the mountain. Um, and we got a reputation for having really good teamwork and camaraderie and the leadership from these gentlemen, it, it was infectious and people just tended to magnet, to, or they tended to be attracted to us, right? In order to really understand what I want to talk about, it's important to go through what an Everest expedition involves. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about the expedition itself and then we're going to shift to a more substantive to topic in my opinion. Um, so this is a shot of Everest from the south side. We chose to climb it from the Nepal side. You can of course climb it from the Chinese side, from the north, which was the original way that George Mallory and his, his crew tried to tackle it. Um, but we chose the south side from Nepal and right here is base camp. You can see all these little yellow dots. Those are tents speckled all about. And it's about a mile long and there's, a, I think about a thousand people in a given season reside in base camp. There's climbers, porters, cooks, trekkers, celebrities, photographers, all sorts of these people just arrive in this base camp here and they're situated here for several months. Um, base camp is nestled at about 17,500 feet above sea level, so it's way the heck up there. And just to give you some perspective on that, if I, were to have, if I were to draw Pike's Peak up here, it'd probably be, the summit of Pike's Peak would be down here somewhere. So the summit of Pike's Peak is about 14,400-ish feet, right? And if any of you have been to the top of that mountain, or any of the mountains here in Colorado, you know that you can get out of breath pretty quickly, right? And we're 3,000 feet higher than that, and this is the place that you're resting and recovering from two months of acclimatization climbs. Um, let's see if these videos work today. So here we are at base camp, David Floor, Sun and Push. <laughs> I will go ahead and give you a pretty tour. Here's Drew, here's Anne. This is my casa right there, it's usually kind of messy. There's Yeti, standing there, surveying the landscape. Rob, off in the distance, let me give you a quick zoom in. There he is. <laughs> Everybody's pretty focused and ready to go, kind of uh, waiting, we've been in for eight days waiting to go. I'll give you a little shot of our destination, there's the ice ball. We're going to bed tomorrow. There's Sherpa Village over there. Anyway, keep trying to take video, but good for now. That is a sweet beard. I miss it so much. <laughs> I know you're shaking your head, Patty B. Um, so after base camp, you climb up this ice fall. It's called the Kumbu Ice Fall. And you can see this, it's a glacier that has carved out this valley, right? It, dro it drops all, you know, if we were to extend this out, it goes another 50 miles all the way down to Lukla Airport. Um, but what, from base camp, you're, you're climbing up this glacier, and it's full of these bowling ball-sized chunks of ice all the way to skyscraper-sized chunks of ice called Ciroc's. And then you can see, even from this perspective, all these little jagged marks. Those are enormous ice crevasses that you have to cross and climb over and maze your way through. This place is terrifying. It's like Dr. Seuss meets Tim Burton meets some sort of Dante circle of hell. <laughs> it's, it's terrifying in there. Um, 
It's statistically, it's the most dangerous place to be also. I have my little journal here from, from when I was climbing on Everest, and so on May 4th I wrote, this is our last lap until the summit go, so we've all been pretty, we've all been really dialing our methods and plans. I'm glad to be mostly done with the ice fall. Yesterday we had four avalanches, three from the west shoulder and one from Nupse. I got a low visceral gut feeling from the first boom and watched the cascading rock and ice flow down the valley. That shit will freak you out. <laughs> so, we had to climb through this thing a couple times during acclimatization climbs and then finally um, on our summit push, of course. So here's a couple shots in the ice fall. Here's my climbing Sherpa Dawa and you can see it's early in the morning relatively because you had to climb through this thing before the sun hit it because it's incredibly unstable in there and that's what prompts these avalanches and extreme danger. Um, so we'd, we'd get started climbing in there about three in the morning. Um, it's also a, a really gorgeous place as well. So it's this weird dichotomy of danger and beauty. And if you've ever seen National Geographic photos of people climbing on Everest, this is a favorite place to get the photos because you see people climbing these ice, or crossing these ladders over these crazy, scary crevasses. Um, and then you get these, these magnificent blues and whites and, and dark hues in there that are just fascinating. Um, here's my buddy Drew climbing up over one of the Ciroc's. Um, this is a three ladders lashed together and they were at the beginning of the trip just straight vertical. By the end of the trip because this glacier moves a, a few inches in a day which is a lot of movement in geological scales this ladder was bent and shifted into an S pattern by the end of the trip. So you'd climb up the first one and then it would jut over here to the left and then it would jut back right. So it felt like we were in the leadership reaction course or something <laughs> with, with extreme stakes. Uh, here I am crossing um, one of the ladders. You'd grab these ropes and you'd clip into one of the ropes there. You see my safety lines clipped in. and. You cannot see the bottom of these things. I'm sure they're several hundred meters deep, but if you fall in one of these crevasses, you're not coming out. And that's a typical thing that happens up there. There are people that fall into these things. I mean, we're up there, you're, and you just hear like, oh, so-and-so fell into a crevasse and died yesterday. Never getting him out, he's gone. And so, on these ladders, it's terrifying. They're rickety, you're crossing them, you're trying to get your crampons situated on the aluminum rungs, and you just, Oh man, don't fall, don't look down. Um, so that's how it went in there. Here's our, P, here's our PJ, Nick Gibson, climbing one of the hardest sections in the ice fall. Uh, I think this was like 50 feet we had to climb up here and then you cross this like really slippery little section and he, you can't see it, it's contrasted against the snow but there's a white fixed line that you clip into for safety and that transition from clipping out of the safety here and into the safety here was always kind of freaky. Here's a shot, or here's a video at the top of the ice fall. There's Rob again. Yeah, I really love that beard. <laughs> so that was at the top of the ice fall. So that was right up, up about here. So just a little after Camp 1. Typically, you only use Camp 1 during one of the earlier acclimatization climbs, but on the summit push, you go all the way from base camp, you skip Camp 1, and you book it for Camp 2, which is around the corner on this side here. Um, camp 2 is nestled at about 21,300 feet. Um, it's sort of like an advanced base camp in the way. It's, it's a place where you're resting before you go up this beast here, which is the Lhotse Ice Face. Oh, that's not the right video. So here's the Lhotse Ice Face here. Um, you climb up this section, and then you drop into Camp 3, which is at 24,000 feet. Camp 3 is literally carved into the side of this ice face and it's a total testament to the badassery of these Sherpa that they carved this thing into the side of the ice face. So 
You can't really see it there. There's a few specks. Um, so you stop there. This is a, typically the point where they put you on supplemental oxygen if you're not a superhuman Sherpa. Um, and then you continue out of camp three up here and then you cross over this which is the yellow band. It's this geological formation that has a yellow tinge to it. Um, and you do a little technical rock climbing to get up over this bump which I like because I'm a rock climber by trade. Um, and it felt like a good rest after climbing thousands of feet of terrifying rock hard blue ice. Um, then you cross up here. This is the Geneva Spur, the shoulder up here. Here's a shot of me on the Geneva Spur. And you drop, once you're on the Geneva Spur, you drop into Camp 4 on this other side here called the South Call. And Camp 4 is at 26,000 feet. And this is the point that um, is affectionately referred to as the death zone, right? Everyone's heard this death zone thing before. Um, and they call it the death zone because your body is no longer adapting to the altitude anymore. It's physically breaking down. And so the name of the game once you get to this point is do not linger here. Don't stay long here because you're just, you're physically dying the longer you spend up there. Um, at the lower altitudes, the lower elevations, you're stressing your body and you're doing these, these acclimatization climbs to get your body adapted to the extreme altitude. Up here, it's not adapting anymore. Um, and for me, in this particular time, um, I had gotten sick from my climbing shirt, but we had shared water on an earlier portion of the climb. He had this flu, upper respiratory infection kind of thing, and I had shared water with him because he had only brought 750 milliliters for like a six hour day of climbing. And he was practically my brother at this point, so there's no way I was gonna be like, sorry bud, you can't have my water. So I gave him some water um, and I caught whatever bug that he had. So at this point in the trip, I was pretty toasted. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Yeah, you can't hear a damn word I'm saying. I mean, unfortunately, the only word you could hear was a bad word. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what it was like up there. It was always windy, and it's weird to say that was like the ideal condition to be at camp for. That was like, we were, we were pretty lucky to just have that mild condition. Typically, it's way worse than that. Um, in camp four, it's this inhospitable place. You get up there, there's tent shreds strewn about, there's tent poles strewn about, there's spent oxygen canisters laying around. There's just trash everywhere, human sewage everywhere. And this is where the trip starts to become serious if it hasn't already been. Um, because you start to notice there's dead bodies laying about too. I mean, they're not just like right out there displayed. I mean, people have tried to sort of cover them up with gravel and things like that or push them off to the side. but. Um, it really makes what you're doing serious. You're, you're, you're like, oh, this isn't, a, this isn't Disneyland. This isn't a place to be goofing around or messing around. We're in a pretty serious environment. Um, and me being sick at that point in time really put things on the front of my mind as, hey, I have to, I have to be making my decisions very deliberately and very intentionally now. Um, out of Camp 4, you climb up this snow field and the way it works is you arrive at Camp 4 at about 10 or 11 a.m. in the morning after climbing out of Camp 3. You don't really camp there per, per se. You're just resting there for about half a day. Um, so you get there about 10 or 11 in the morning. You rest till about 8 or 9 p.m. And then you start climbing up this Everest pyramid about 9 p.m. at night. Um, this is only about 3,000 feet of climbing. But it takes people typically eight to 12 hours to climb up this thing. And if any of you have done the Colorado Springs incline, that thing is only 2,100 feet. And I think when I, one of my fastest times on that is less than 30 minutes. 
So that kind of puts things into perspective as well. 30 minutes to do 2,000 feet or 12 hours to do 3,000 feet. It's like being on the moon up here. You're moving incredibly slowly. Um, but you're climbing through the night. You get up here. This is the balcony at about 28,000 feet. And you go up here to the south summit. And then you go up here, the Hillary steps up here. And then the top of the world's at 29,035 feet. Um, I got sick, like I said, and was forced to turn around about here. Just a little over 27,000 feet. It was midnight. I'm climbing with my Sherpa Dawa. I'm monitoring my pace, and I'm looking at how much oxygen I'm using, and I realize this isn't going to happen. I can't talk. I can hardly breathe. I can barely move. Even relative to the other climbers, I'm getting passed left and right by these guys that I considered to be weaker climbers than I was. And it was just apparent that if I tried to keep going up, the goose would be cooked. I knew that if I kept going up, I wouldn't come back down. So I stopped there, radioed in that I was turning around. My buddy Rob and Drew came up. We chatted for a little while, gave them a hug, turned around. Um, and just before I had left to go back down, I'm sitting there. It's a starry night. I'm looking out over the Himalaya range. And it's strange to be looking down on stars and these gigantic mountains peeking through clouds. And I'm just trying to take in the scenery. And I look off to the left, probably about for me to to Kristen there, and I see this odd shape that's, that shouldn't be there, right? I'm like, okay, there's rocks and there's ice, but all of a sudden there's this thing that shouldn't be there, and I realize it's a, a human being laying there, some corpse from who, who knows how long it's been there, right? And I just was thinking to myself, I gotta get the hell off this mountain now. <laughs> so that's how an Everest expedition unfolds. You start down here, you go up this Kumu ice fall, up to Camp 2, up this intense Lhotse Lo ice face, which I'm going to talk more about in a second, up to Camp 4, and then there's the summit pyramid there. But what I really, really want to talk about, I mean, Everest is a fun thing to talk about, and it's cool. We'd all be satisfied to be like, okay, some bald guy told me what it's like to climb Everest. Cool, cool. What I really want you guys to take away because this, this symposium is about ethics and respect for human dignity, right? Well, on our trip to Mount Everest, I was fortunate enough to meet these characters. These are the indigenous people of Nepal, of the Himalayan range. They're called Sherpa. Everybody's sort of heard of a Sherpa before. They think Sherpa is synonymous with carrying loads and portering things, right? Well, it's actually an ethnic group that migrated across the Tibetan border and into Nepal a few thousand years ago. And so they've been living in this Himalayan range for a few thousand years, and they're physically adapted to this high elevation. They are ultimate badasses. I mean, these guys, they'll, they'll carry ref refrigerators. Literally, I've seen them carrying refrigerators up mountains because they're, they're portering this stuff along. And you're just struggling along with your little camera and water bottle. You know, you're like, oh my god. Um, <laughs> They're absolute superhumans. Um, but more than that, what really sets them apart in my mind is they're some of the most kind, gentle, compassionate people I've ever met in my life. These people would give you the shirt off their back even if it was the only shirt that they owned. And you can see here, they have a, they have a very like familial uh, tendency about them. You can see they're all smooshed together in this dog pile and they're sort of cuddling with each other. And these are also like the most badass men I've ever met in my life, right? Um, and for me in particular, you know, I showed up and I'm hiking in, I'm trekking in, I'm just walking along, and one of these guys would come up and just start holding my hand. And I'm like, okay, I'm a grown man, this is a grown man. So it was a little uncomfortable, I'd shake his hand off and be like, oh, look at that mountain over there. You know, just trying to make an excuse to let go. Another time, I'm, we're standing around getting a briefing to go start one of our acclimatization climbs, and um, it was actually this guy right here, Mingma. He comes up behind me. I'm standing there. He just puts his arms over me and his chin on my shoulder like I'm his high school girlfriend or something. <laughs> and I, I'm just like, all right, this is happening. <laughs> I'm going to go with it. Um, it's incredibly flattering, though, that these people care about you in that way. 
here's my, here's my climbing Sherpa Dawa. So what happens is you show up as a climber and you get assigned um, a Sherpa to climb with you and they act as your guide and they, in a lot of ways, take care of you and make sure your life is not in any serious peril. Um, I, when, I was, when I met Dawa, he was the same age as me, the same height as me, he had the same sense of humor. I mean, we instantly bonded like brothers, and even to this day, I keep in touch with him. He's a fantastic human being, and I would do anything for this guy. Yeah, so what this video is getting at is you have this indigenous people that live in this valley. They've lived there for thousands of years. And then the influx of Western climbers coming into the valley created this economic boon for these Sherpa people, but also made this socioeconomic disparity incredibly apparent to them, right? I mean, Nepal is one of the most poor Asian countries, and relatively speaking, the Sherpa make a lot more than just an average Nepali person, especially if you're living up in this Khumbu Valley farming potatoes or something like that. Um, so. They're, they're wealthy relative to their contemporaries in the valley, but relative to these white Westerners that are coming in with this fixed purpose to climb this mountain, they are living off scraps, right? And they know that. They're not idiots. These are human beings. I mean, these are smart people. And so they just, they have just, they just put up with it. They just accept it for what it is. And like I said, they're the sweetest people you ever meet. And I realized this right away that this, this inequity existed, and I was like, you know what, I don't understand why this is the way it is. These people are way better climbers than I am or ever will be. And they're taking care of me. They're taking care, they have my life in their hands. Why is it that we treat them this way? Um, so I spent a, a lot of my time immersing myself in their culture. Instead of going to my dining tent, I'd go to their dining tent and eat their local cuisine and try to learn their language. And it was this weird thing too because clients and climbers that paid lots of money to climb Mount Everest, they show up and they, they're put in these tents in base camp and you see that the Sherpa and the climbing clients are segregated. You have these people over here that paid lots of money to climb and they go off to their tent and they have a dining tent and you go in there and pe someone comes in and they serve you your meal. Over here you have these Sherpa that are just done carrying water and food and stuff up and they go off to their part of the tent or their part of the camp and they sort of live off in this village segregated. Well this is me in the Sherpa part of the tent or Sherpa part of the camp. I'm boozing with these guys and eating some Italian sausage and having a good time. Um, and they loved it. They're like this is so unusual for a person to come spend time with us like this. Another thing that happened while I was there, and this is one of my absolute favorite pictures from the whole trip, which is odd because it's kind of out of focus. There's no mountains. It's not, there's nothing particularly majestic about this picture. But what this is, is in base camp, we had a tent that you could go charge your electronics in. Your laptops, your cell phones, your cameras, things like that. And there was a generator and some solar panels hooked up, and you could go in there and just plug your electronics in. Well, since Everest is a lot of time of resting and recovering and letting your body adapt to the stress you're putting on it, we were always looking for things to do to entertain ourselves. And so we realized, hey, if we put a laptop on here and get a projector, we could project movies up on the side of the tent. And initially, we started doing this with just a couple, couple of us buddies, you know. And then I started looking around, and I'm like, where the hell are all the Sherpa? Where are the guys that are, we're climbing with day in and day out? You're done climbing, and they go to their side of the camp, and we go to our side of the camp. And we're in here watching movies, and I don't know what the heck they're doing over there in their part of the camp, probably just laying in their sleeping bag, staring at the tent ceiling or something, I don't know. So I was like, I'm gonna start inviting these homeboys to come watch movies with us. And they freaking loved it. This had never happened before, ever. In the years and years and years that people climb Everest, no one had ever thought to invite these guys over in a social capacity like this. And the Sherpa loved it. I mean, they looked forward to this. They started, they started looking for me during the day and saying, hey, are you a movie guy? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and they'd be like, can we, wa can we watch movie tonight? I said, yeah, definitely, man. Come on over. What do you want to watch? And they'd be like, hmm, something sexy, something violent. <laughs> so 
I'm like, all right, I guess we're watching Transformers again. <laughs> but what really bothered me was the other, the other climbers, the other clients, they didn't like it. They were like, hey, can you, they, they pulled me aside, they're like, hey man, can you stop inviting the Sherpa over to this tent? This is supposed to be like our little personal section and they're, they're kind of smelly and they don't speak English and they're, they're sort of weird and I'm like, hell no man, get out of my face. I'm, <laughs> I'm inviting them over and you can get tough nuggies, you know? Um, another thing that I really loved about my particular Sherpa Dawa is he was a bit of a social butterfly. And so the way it went is you would get done climbing with your Sherpa and they would take you back to your camp so that you could get your crampons and boots off and go get some tea and food and rest because you're usually wiped out after a long day of climbing. And Dawa would always, we'd always get into camp and Dawa would never take me straight to our portion of the camp. He would always take me on these weird detours off to the side and I'd end up in some weird tent with some Sherpas that I'd never met before. And it, it was sort of annoying at first because I'm like, come on, man, like, I don't know these people. But after a while, I was like, this guy's doing me a massive favor. He's showing me a side of Everest that most people don't get to see. And in this particular day, we come off the Kumbu Ice Fall. This is back at base camp. And he takes me to a tent with a few Sherpa, including these two guys. And this old dude, he's sitting on this wicker basket here. He's just sitting there. Um, and I walk up. And he's just the politest guy I've ever met. He's, he immediately stands up like I'm some sort of person of importance, showing this respect that we learn here, you know? And he starts serving me tea. He goes and gets me some tea, and he's serving me tea. And I'm like, man, who's this guy treating me like a celebrity? I don't get it. And I asked Dawa, I'm like, who is this guy? And he's like, well, this is the oldest man to have ever summited Everest. He was 82 when he summited Everest. And he was in base camp thinking about doing it again. He's like, eh, I don't know, maybe I'll go back up again this year. I don't know, I'm not, I haven't decided yet. So this guy's serving me tea. I'm like, dude, I should be serving you tea. I should be doing your laundry or something, man. <coughs> totally, totally humbling experience. Then over here, if this isn't weird enough, this guy is also hanging out. And so now I'm like, all right, Dawa, no more surprises. Who's this cat? He's like, Oh, this guy here, he has the speed ascent from base camp to the summit. The, the world record speed ascent. And I'm like, okay, doing the math on my fingers. I'm like, all right, it takes a strong average guy about four days to do this, right? I'm just, I just bragged about climbing the incline in under 30 minutes, and that's fast. Like, most people aren't doing the incline that fast. So the people that show up to Everest are in really, really, really good shape. Rob's even faster than I am. This guy is amazing. He's got the freak gene. Takes us four days to climb to the summit of Everest. And that's good. So I'm like, all right, Sherpa or badass, let's cut it in half. Let's say, what is it, two days for this guy? Is the record two days? Dad was like, no, man. This guy did it in eight hours and 11 minutes. <laughs> how's that even, how's that humanly possible? I'm just blown away. Totally blown away. So this is like, I'm basically, I'm basically taking a picture of Superman right now. <laughs> also, this year, um, so it was 2013 we were up there. We had a couple um, famous Western Alpine climbers. Simone Moreau, he's Italian, and Uli Steck, he's from Switzerland. These guys are well known in the climbing community as some of the best alpinists in the world. They also had a photographer with them, this guy named Jonathan Griffith. And these guys were up there trying to do some cutting edge alpine style climbing on Mount Everest. And they got in a bit of a confrontation with the Sherpa while we were up there. And so you're gonna, I, I show this to contrast the difference between people that show up to a, a location and embrace the culture and give people human respect and dignity and people that do not. So basically what happened, as you saw in the video, is these European climbers are climbing up the Lotsu face here out of Camp 2. Here's that shot of them. They're climbing up this to the left. There's a Sherpa fixing team. They're putting these fixed lines into the Lotsu ice face. 
And these gentlemen traversed the line in between the lead Sherpa and the second Sherpa in the line. Now it's disputed that um, the Sherpa said, hey, these guys kicked a chunk of ice down on the second Sherpa and it hit him in the face and his tooth went through his bottom lip and there was blood all over the place. And so the, the Sherpa immediately were like, we got to rappel down and get this guy some medical attention. The European climbers denied that that had ever happened. Um, and as you saw, th this turned into this giant fight because Simone after that called the Sherpa a bad word and this immediately spread like wildfire throughout the Western media. And this is the official account according to these European climbers. This was published just last year, so four years after the event, and this is still how it's being published. They say, hey, we know that there's this, this social ec economic tension between the Sherpa and these climbers coming in the valley. We're, we're, we suspect that is this, this tension was bubbling up. And here's the account they said, oh, these Europeans had no idea that the Sherpa didn't want them on the Lhotse face that day. That is just factually incorrect. Um, I saw it with my own two eyes, and Rob saw it with his own two eyes, the Sherpa asking these gentlemen not to climb up. Now, anyone here who's a mountaineer knows that no one else has a right to say, hey, don't go up there. They never demanded don't go up there. They just said, hey, can you please not go up there out of safety concern for these Sherpa that are fixing the line. And these Europeans are like, hey, we're cutting edge alpinists. Our poo doesn't stink. We're going up there. Like, we're going to do what we're going to do, and we don't really, no one can tell us we can't go up there. Well, after this event, they said, hey, actually, we didn't even know. No one told us not to go up there. And that's just not true. Then he say, well, now that they're up there, Uli and Simone took great care not to knock any ice down. Like I said, the Sherpa were like, no, no, no. He did knock ice down on us, and it was extremely dangerous, just like we said it would be if these guys were up there. And then the last thing was Simone called these Sherpa a mother effer, right? He threw this Nepali insult at them. Machikne. And Sherpa Machikne doesn't just translate to mother effer as they say in the video. You saw the two Sherpas reaction to this word where they were like, it's a very, very, very bad word. I don't even want to say it in your camera. This word Machikne doesn't just mean mother effer. It has racial connotation attached to it, which they kind of left out. They didn't really translate it very well. It's more akin to calling someone the N-word, right? So you have this culture, these people that are just down downtrodden and they're, they're there's massive inequity between these people and the Western climbers. And then you have these entitled Western climbers basically calling them racial slurs. And so you could see why it led to that. Now, the Sherpa came to me and they said, hey, Colin, you're, you're a buddy of ours. We consider you to be family now. Can you please take our account of this event back home with you? And I did. I got an interview from the lead fixing Sherpa. And I took his story and nobody really wanted it. Here's how he's accounted for, right? They draw this illustration in that video, and he looks like this angry guy. It looks like something out of like The Simpsons or something, right? Here's what he looks like in real life. Angry Sherpa, Mingma Tenzing from Port Say, he's 27 years old, gave me his interview. I went to a tent with him and my buddy Tashi, and I wrote down his entire side of the event like a, a, a wannabe journalist or something. I'm like, I don't know how to do this, but just tell me what happened and I'll write it down. I'll go home and I'll tell everyone about it. So I come home, I contacted Outside Magazine, Rock and Ice, Climbing, anybody who would have wanted this story, including the people that made that video. The people that made that video actually interviewed me for about an hour. They knew his name, they knew what he looked like, they knew his side of the story, and they left it completely out. Now why do you suppose that is? Well, like I said, those two, those two European climbers are all-stars. These guys are sponsored athletes, and to tarnish their reputation, there's nothing profitable about it, right? So the Sherpa just continue to live there, doing their thing. Nobody knows who, they, who this guy was, and the official story is what you saw. And here's Dawa and Tashi 
looking at the news, they're looking at this, and they're like, holy crap, just like we thought, the Western world has no idea what happened here, and they've got the story totally wrong. So the takeaway for me, here's Dawa, here's Tashi, you love these guys, um, is these Sherpa, they're incredible people. And the event, the, this, whole, this entire experience for me was life-changing. Going there to climb Everest, Everest became not really the point for me. The entire experience was far more enriching, getting to know these Sherpa, and the mountain, getting to the top of this mountain, ultimately felt like just this arbitrary goal just to get to the top of the summit, right? So I encourage all of you, because we're talking about ethics and respect for human dignity, when you go out in the real world, when you go travel the world, when you just explore your local communities, get out of the mindset of us and them. I mean, that's an instinctual reaction we have. You meet somebody, they have their identity, you have your identity. Your identity is surrounded around like the language you speak, the religion you have, you know, the values you hold, all of these things. I mean, they can be as simple as like, oh, I'm a soccer player or I'm an Air Force Academy cadet. And you're just naturally more comfortable being around people that have similar identities as you, right? So when you meet somebody who has a total different culture than you, they speak a different language than you, they walk up and they hold your hand or something like that, right? It's weird. Your instinctual reaction is to recoil from that. And you, re you retreat to your tribe because that's comfortable. And when we retreat to our tribes, inevitably that comes with this sort of a defensive mindset. And so you feel like, oh, let's just leave them over there on that side of camp and we'll go on our side of the camp and we're just, here to, we're just here to climb a mountain and we'll just go about our business, right? Metaphorically speaking, we all experience that sort of thing. So I'm just encouraging you, when you go out there, challenge yourself, right? We're Air Force Academy cadets or you're Americans or whatnot, but think of yourself, hey, I'm an American, but I'm also a, I'm also a, a human being. I'm, you know, I'm a citizen of this world, right? Just because that person was born in that country and I was born in this country, doesn't inherently make me any better than them, right? Go out there and challenge yourself in that way. Go live your life with an open mind, okay? And that's pretty much all I have to say about this trip. Um, but before I go, I have one last video to show you. Rob hates that I show this video, but I'm going to show it anyway. <laughs> We're almost out of time. badass. All right, we got about eight minutes it looks like, so um, I can keep rambling or I think it's more fun to take questions because I know Everest is kind of this thing that people want to know more about, so fire away. Questions? Questions? Yep. No, we decided um, just from a safety ORM standpoint, and I know it's, you don't like to hear those letters in the same <laughs> sequence. Um, but seriously, from a practical safety standpoint, we did some research on it and we said, you know, that's incredibly dangerous. And I, I know climbers who have done Everest without oxygen, and some of them say, hey, you know what, I wish I hadn't had done that. I'm, I think I'm suffering from permanent brain damage from doing that. Um, 
So we chose not to do that. And like I said, we were there with this purpose of getting this flag to the top and we thought the better chance of success was with oxygen, so. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so we spend uh, two weeks to a month trekking into base camp and you travel all through their villages and you see um, what the Sherpa, how the Sherpa live that aren't even climbers, right? So typically they, they mostly just sort of farm this um, valley. A lot of their I income and economy is based on tourism from these trekkers coming in. But aside from that, they're uh, um, pretty agrarian, I guess. They farm these potatoes that were brought in from uh, the British when they settled that valley. And um, they're just, like I said, I can't say it enough, they're the sweetest people, you know. You show up and there's little kids running around and they're just, you give them little chocolates and then they follow you around for like, you know, the next couple hours. And you're just like huffing and puffing like you're dying because you're like 13,000 feet or something. And these little kids are just running around and they're the cutest people you ever meet, so. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, I actually love to talk about this, and Rob reminded me that I didn't bring it up. That, that slide where I had that guy, the Superman um, uh, speed ascent guy, what happened was the night I was climbing, it's about midnight, a little before midnight, I sort of knew in the back of my mind that I was going to turn around, and out of nowhere, these Sherpa climb up from the dark. They're just, I'm on a fixed line, and all of a sudden I'm surrounded by five or six of these Sherpa. I'm climbing with Dawa and these people just all of a sudden surround me. I look over, Dawa's chitter chattering with one of these guys. And they look at me and then they go back and they're chatting again and it's in Sherpa. I have no idea what they're saying and since I'm in a world of hurt, it's hard for me to even paying attention to what's going on. And Dawa looks at me and he says, hey man, remember that guy we met down at base camp, the, the speed ascent guy? I was like, yeah. He's like, that's him right there. He was up there guiding a, Sherpa, a, a group of Sherpa to the summit that night. And when he came across Dawa and I, he said, you know what, there's Colin and there's Dawa, I wanna see what's going on. Dawa told him that I was, in, I was sick and he was worried about me, so this guy was like, Colin is family, we're not going anywhere if this guy's not safe. So suddenly I'm surrounded by these five or six ultra badass Sherpa that are just like, nothing is gonna happen to you, man. Like, you're part of the you're part of the Cosa Nostra now. Like you're safe, you know. So that was an incredibly flattering moment for me, and it lifted my spirits enough. Um, when I did turn around, Dawa made sure I was safe when we got down. Um, I made sure to turn around with enough gas left in the tank so that I didn't have to get dragged down. Right? I was like, I could probably go up another 500 vertical feet, maybe another 1,000 vertical feet, but it would be a hell of a lot harder getting down. And so once I knew that the summit wasn't gonna happen without me dying. I was like, I might as well save some in the tank to get off this thing safely because you're in an environment where if you get sick or if you, if you put yourself into a position where you can't hardly move, you're endangering all, a bunch of people around you. And you see that happen in like movies and things like that. John Krakauer's account of the 1996 tragedy, that's what led to a lot of the um, other climbers dying was somebody made a bad decision and then everyone else because they have this moral instinct to save a person who's in danger they get put in this position where now their life is in danger so yes sir sir why did you choose to do Everest as your last summit and what were some of the experiences that you took from the other summits that so I chose to do La Everest as my last summit because that's the one they invited me to do um, it was the last of them. I had, I had climbed in South America and in and some of these other things separately. Um, honestly, it was never on my bucket list to do Mount Everest um, because I was one of those snobby climbers in the gym that just sort of been like, ah, oh, Everest isn't worth my time. Um, and holy crap was my mind changed when I was there. And when I was a kid, I even wrote a paper for philosophy class about morality and mountaineering. And I went back to read what I had thought about Mount Everest as a cadet after I had done the event, and I was like kind of ashamed of the things I was saying. I was like, how presumptuous of me to say these things about something I know nothing about. Um, but just climbing mountains in general, I mean, I've climbed hundreds of other mountains, 
And it's an awesome experience. I mean, everyone, everyone has their thing they're interested in. For me, mountains speak to me. Um, so I love doing it. And it's hard, it's hard to put in words the experiences that I've had on these mountains, aside from just learning more about myself, putting myself in these hard positions where the decisions you make are more binary, they're more life and death sort of decisions. Um, and, and it simplifies life in a lot of ways. And all, oh, by the way, you're in this majestic landscape and you get to see things that most people never get to see in their lives. So I just love it. And I would encourage you all, we're in Colorado, we have some of the best mountains in the world in our backyard. So I would encourage you to get out there. Some of them are pretty accessible even for novice climbers. Yes, sir. I appreciate that. I mean, to me, that's, that was the message I'm trying to give to all of you, that don't get distracted with some of these immediate goals, that some of the immediate things that we can get target fixation on. Look around you and, and see and understand that interacting with humans and treating people in a humane way with respect and dignity, those are oftentimes the more cherished bits that you're going to get out of experiences. I think that's time, so I need to let you guys go so we can get to another um, event. So thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs>